Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to join us for the third webinar of the year, which is entitled uh, the on-site thermal desorption in pipes, in specifically in remote locations. Uh, I'm Aurélien, I'm the business the development manager and engineering uh, department manager, uh, and I will be your host today for this webinar. Uh, today we have the huge privilege to have uh, our CEO uh, to as a speaker for the presentation. Uh, it will be quite a long presentation. I just saw the slide just before, so uh, the format will be a little bit different uh, as usual. Um, the idea will be to run for the presentation during approximately 45 minutes. And at the same time, please feel free to add all the questions in the chat. I will uh, I will directly answer it if it's a short question. If it's a long question, I will directly discuss, interrupt uh, Jan, and to make sure that you can you, you won't miss any information for the understanding uh, of this webinar. Uh, just before starting, just quick uh, pragmatic and technical information. You will uh, receive after the, after this webinar uh, certificates of attendance attendance. Um, and you you can see our webinar once again on on our YouTube channel. Um, the subject today will be focused on the remote locations because basically, you know, yesterday I was once again discussing with my grandmother about thermal desorption, and she she told me that it's a huge uh, it's a huge installation and it's quite complicated to implement it on site. Uh, and I, I was I, I told her that. No, we can work in the remote locations and you will see it's quite easy. You, you just need a truck. You just need to go there and you can remediate fully uh, a site using the thermal desorption in the remote location. So Jan will spend some time explaining how we can we can do that today. So no, Jan, uh, I'll let you the floor and uh, please respect the 45 minutes for your presentation. <laughs> no, I will. I will. You spoiled everything already. <laughs> well, good morning. Good afternoon to uh, to all of you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've seen that there are some of you that are in uh, uh, that, that are this webinar. We are holding the same webinar in six hours for North and South America. So if you had to wake up earlier, you didn't realize you have another chance a bit later today. Uh, just do that as a um, uh, as a reminder, so yes, the, the subject of today is remote sites, um, and we'll see what how specific they are and how thermal, and in particular on-site thermal, is uh, is applicable to there and what's unique. Um, as I've been pushed to be very brief on our, our who we are, our company presentation, I just it, it it might be relevant to talk a little bit about where we come from. We come from uh, conventional thermal desorption. It's still applied today, but it is. The very large rotary kilns was applied at fixed locations, uh, started in the US. We had a bunch in, in, in Europe as well. We don't have any anymore. We completely switched to files in this case. Um, this was the first application in remote locations, actually. Uh, we probably filed that patent in 1992, was granted in 1993. It's now completely public domain, as you can imagine. But the idea was indeed to put a rotary kiln on a truck and then to go from site to site, which made it much easier to treat remote locations where the dig and dump option was either difficult or uh, very costly. We started first um, 2004 with the first application with in situ thermal, uh, improved it in 2010, got a lot of praise and awards. Currently, we have a, a short a small engineering team essentially with uh, 58 people. We, we're based here in Brussels and in uh, North America in uh, in South Dakota. Uh, and we are we are operating from here all over the world with local partners. So the team you know and you see are only the people who are supporting your local companies you work with and who are the remediation contractors and such. I'll also be brief, but something that I really address Regularly, it's why the hell do we do this? Why are we in business? What's our purpose? Our purpose is clearly to contribute one way or the other to the sustainable development. So if you look at the 17 SDGs, nine of them are directly affected by clean and cleaner soil, which then implicates directly or indirectly, of course, better clean water, 
uh, zero uh, pollution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to remind you that. And then the second reason why is in history, I've been in this business for way too long, probably. But I remember when we started, in, when I started in this business in the early 90s, the policy was to clean up soil completely multifunctional. It was essentially to say, you have a contamination, you bring it back to the pristine state. And the reason why I, I alluded in this webinar right here is because in remote sites, I think it makes sense to still think that way. You'll see what, what specific is in remote sites where we just say, you know, polluter pays, you know, you, you bring back your site in the same condition as you received it. But why did we deviate from that and, and went to uh, uh, what is now commonly known as, you know, uh, risk-based land management? We did that because it was unsustainable from an economic standpoint, because the only solution was essentially dig and dump. So we were spending a hell of a lot of money just to excavate soil and bring it somewhere else, mm -hmm. and then take clean soil and put it back in, which was, so the idea was, well, that's crazy. Let's do at least the minimum, which is manage the risk. Mm -hmm. Today, we, feel, we, we see that the limit of that policy in the fact that yeah, we we have we don't actually completely clean up stuff. We leave it we leave it in place, and we continue the development of our cities and towns outside of that area. So we 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 have a huge urban sprawl, and we take and take more land. So at some point, we need to go back to a truly and, sustainable remediation. And just so you are saying that it's historical point of view, but it's not the same today. Today we still the, the main core the main policy base is still risk based, but there is clearly a, a push to to sustainable remediation, also called the land stewardship, what Nicole has been promoting quite okay. a bit. The, the idea is to also take society in place so that there is a cost of not doing the full cleanup. There is a cost of re of, of having uh, pollution hampering the further development of your uh, uh, of your country and, and having society hampered by not being able to do whatever they want with their land, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if you as an owner, you remediate industrial land, you say, I'm going to just going to leave it as industry, where, but it might be that the community wants to put schools there because that's where the population mm -hmm. is growing. By the fact that you chose to just limit the risk for industry, the school has to go five kilometers farther mm -hmm. and the housing is five kilometers farther, which then has indirect impacts on mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, that's the point of, playing our role in this as well. Yeah, I have kids, it doesn't make any sense to do that. <laughs> yeah. But then when you look at it in, 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 uh, in the logic about circularity, you remember circularity is, um, I'm sorry, uh, the linear economy in our business is essentially going from primary use, contaminated, you excavate it, you haul it somewhere else and you dispose of it. That's exactly the same thing as you do with your clothes. You know, you, you buy them, you don't like them anymore, you throw them away, you buy a new one. Mm -hmm. That's the linear economy, level zero circularity. The, the first level is essentially to, oops, I'm sorry, to clean it, oops, to clean it, uh, to still to, to dig in and, and hold it, but then to clean it and then to recycle it, which at least is, is, is a better option. Mm -hmm. The second level is then to go on to treating it on site, which we will do, and then the fourth level I don't know, it, it, it's doing weird things, I'm sorry. The mm -hmm. fourth level is to uh, do it completely in situ without excavation. That's that's part of it. Our vision on it is essentially to develop solutions that are that are rapid, that are effective, that are climate friendly, that are affordable, that are predictable. Basically. That's the vision of Amherst Technologies. That's our vision, and we think that if we can do that, that's the best way to provide sustainable solutions to, uh, to, the, to the market in general. Uh, and to close the way we, we work, we work for essentially all over the world for either final kinds and or our partners uh, in the meantime. And we train them with a fully operational hybrid training facility so that we can actually transfer technology to those who need it and who will apply it. Okay. What we'll address today is more the left hand side of this slide, which is the on site or ex situ, so excavating materials, and you'll see why. But there's also a big part of the activity which is doing it without excavation in situ. And you'll see why probably ex situ is more applied for remote locations than in situ, but in some cases you can do both. So what's specific about remote sites? Well, remote sites we found out over time, over the course of time that it's first and foremost a logistical challenge. Logistical challenge to get your gear up wherever you need to be, whether it's on remote islands, where it's up north, where it's in the middle of the jungle, 
the logistic part is, is, is the most uh, critical. And when we used to run uh, rotary kilns and, and large equipment, that was really the nightmare because you needed to get all that very heavy equipment, which is not, which is oversized, overload, uh, to go very difficult places. And, and so it's, it's a big challenge. The second part is uh, support and supplies. When you have large units that maintenance and replacing a bolt is going to cost you a fortune if you don't have all the spare. So it's pretty hard because there is no available supply. Um, if you work in, in, you know, in industrialized areas, it's pretty easy. You break something, next day you have, you have a spare. There mm -hmm. it's, it's a big, 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 big challenge. Also the dig and dump solution is either the only one which is digging and dumping it two kilometers farther and then you're pushing the whole thing to the next generation. But the actually treating it with dig and dump is either completely unavailable because of logistics or transportation or extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. You need to usually put it on ships or truck it on thousands of kilometers. It's it's really complicated. So on the site solutions are, are to be favored. Usually we face quite strict targets because it's driven by local communities who have hosted, as, as you'll see, usually oil and gas or military sites that are now closing. So the whole point of them is, yeah, now you, you use our land, you go away, you at least need to give us the land back in the condition you got it. So to go back to my introduction, it's the kind of multifunctional request they want. They say, we, we want, we want if, if it was natural site, natural soil, you bring it, you give it back to us in the same condition. We will not accept to have residual contamination left behind. It's it's some some specific uh, about remote sites which you don't have in other industrial areas. Yeah, but it should be the same for every site. It should be, but the, the reality it's it, it's more it's it, it's more actual than in in in, in those in okay. those remote sites than what we see in in, in others. And the main problem owners are usually oil and gas companies and military sites. There are some others, but that's the bulk of what remote sites represent. Uh, what we also have available is usually earth moving equipment is available because there are there are things that, that work uh, down there. And usually diesel or heating oil is also readily and easily available. There is it's, there is hardly any electrical grid. There is hardly any any uh, the drilling is sometimes very complicated to find. And that's also what, what explains that it's hard to do in situ because those simple equipment are not very mm -hmm. But earth moving is something that is uh, pretty easy. A reminder for those who don't know us uh, very well, how does tunnel work? And in particular, conductive heating, it's uh, pretty simple to explain. We put the heating elements or pipes in the soil. We heat them with burners that heats the soil in itself. <laughs> And by heating up, we transfer or we mobilize the contaminant in vapor phase. And by transferring it in vapor phase, we collect those vapors. And then you'll see we treat them. We can either treat them by reburn or by uh, condensing or with some in situ treatment. So, but the idea of how to treat it is heat it, make it sweat, recover the vaporized sweat, and then mm -hmm. the soil in itself is uh, free of contaminants. That's the that's the idea. It can be heated. The heating can can occur either with, let's say, uh, on the left hand side, diesel burners or biodiesel burners or liquid fuel. It can be done by vapor fuel, which is propane, biogas, uh, or it can be done by electrical uh, heaters. Or and yeah, we can do the three in remote sites, and we'll address that. You'll see that it's clearly. The diesel or the biodiesel one, which would be favored because even propane or natural gas is hard to find unless you're on an oil and gas field, which then favors that because there's readily available. And usually electricity is very hard. There is no grid. So electricity will be made with diesel generators one way or the other, which as, as we'll see pretty soon is a little bit absurd. It's just a quick question there. Is it drastically different the, the 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 systems if you are using the liquid fuel or the or, or the propane natural gas i mean in terms of electrical boxes and the monitoring and the stuff no, like those two will be very similar see le left and right here you have gas and here you have diesel it it's pretty much the same electric okay. is of course quite different these are pretty much the same but on remote sites you'll see that the diesel is easier because it's easier to, to supply diesel or heating oil than to supply propane or natural gas. Okay. With the exception there in oil fields, remote oil fields, usually they have a lot of natural gas, mm -hmm. which is not always used. So that's it, and which is 
flared by default. So you take that flare gas and you use that as fuel. So mm -hmm. then there, there you have it. But it's uh, uh, but but from the way it works, it's it's very similar in both cases. As you can see here, you can do the reburn, which we'll talk about, or the vapor treatment. Of course, you cannot do reburn when it comes okay. to electric. Thank you. Um, now we're talking, but uh, in situ, so, uh, so sorry, remote sites. So how does it work in in uh, in, in an ex situ pile? Essentially, you will put some layers of soil, and we'll we'll insert the heating element. So we don't insert it actually. We lay one layer of soil, then we place the heating elements, and we put another layer of soil, then we put another layer of heating elements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, like a lasagna, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, and separately, of course, you have a, an extraction network, which will then collect the vapors that you generate by heating, and that uh, will be treated separately. So the the, the, the way to 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 implement that is pretty simple. It is using, uh, let's say, earth moving equipment to build piles and to place pipes. So there is no drilling equipment with with an excavator and a front loader. You can do the whole thing. You can you can implement it and dismantle it uh, very easily, which it, which is part of what is available in remote sites. And then, of course, at the end of each, then you put a burner and you start. Type of contaminants treated. Uh, there is a little mistake in this slide. Now. I apologize for that. Uh, it's essentially ex everything except heavy metals. But in a remote site, we'll see 80, 90 percent of the cases we've been involved with is oil. It's oil and, and all the oil derivatives. In some other cases, we have a bunch of other stuff, but mostly it's it's going to be oil. Uh, but so uh, why why is that the list of contaminants? It's because we are reaching certain temperatures at which those contaminants are volatile. And why are we not going higher? Because if you go higher to treat, I don't know, say a copper or nickel or zinc, you're going to have temperatures which where you will volatilize copper or zinc, or but you will also volatilize iron, aluminium. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's no longer a separation technique. At 300 up to 300, 400 degrees, of course, temperature is a separation. The contaminants you're aiming are volatile, and the soil you want to clean is solid, so you make a separation. So that's the point. OK. Um, as you'll see, the only metal we treat, which is the exception to the exception, is mercury. And for the obvious reason that mercury is volatile at 300 and, and so many. So the principle we also talk about conduction is to insert these pipes in the soil and then by contact. That's why conduction is the, it is the key word here. By contact, of course, the soil will, will slowly get warmer and warmer. So why is contact important? Because that is the way that the heat that we are conveying into the soil will be transferred to the soil. Remember, you remember there are three ways for heat to be transferred. It could be by convection, which is the way this room has been heated. You have a, a heating source, and then the air is transporting it. It's convective flow. It can be radiation if you go outside. It's sunny today. You're going to be warm because of the radiation of the sun. And then there is conduction, which is by contact. And that's essentially what we are based upon. And when you are working remotely, is it better to work with convection or by conduction? Yeah, it, it's going to be conduction anyway, because convection would, would mean that you would mix the soil. Mm -hmm. you, would, you would actively move it. So that it's pretty hard on solid to heat mm -hmm. them with convection. Mm -hmm. But what you would do here is understand, what you see here is you understand why it's so important to use conduction. It's so important because depending on the nature of the soil, and that's often the case that you have different types of soil, mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if you see how quickly they will heat, so in what per meter Kelvin, you'll see that there is almost no difference within the type of soil. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite independent. I mean, the, the, the way the heat progresses in the soil is almost independent of the type of soil, which is very different when you look at permeability. So when you start to say, Say you want to blow hot air in there, which would be a convective way of doing it. You, mm -hmm. you, blow, you blow, say, a hot fluid in the soil to clean it. The issue is that your hot air or your hot fluid will follow preferential paths, will always follow the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And that means that it will only affect certain areas, which will be cleaned very quickly, and then some others will, will never be cleaned. Oh, very, 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 uh, it would take a, a long time. So you'll have a, a very heterogeneous heating. Mm -hmm. Whereas with conduction, even if your soil is heterogeneous, you'll have a pretty effective homogeneous heating. And you could see it in, in, in this slide, by the way, that like 
like we measured some temperature, you could see how almost hom hom homogeneous on the right hand side you have heating. This was in a container box. Uh, the, 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 the temperature uh, rises with time. Mm -hmm. um, in piles, as in uh, in situ, this is this would be a view of how our heaters are placed. This is a horizontal view, like a, you, you cut it. This is you look in front of you in a pile. If you were to do that in situ, you would see it from above. But that's but that's how you cover the whole volume. And we'll talk a bit later about that. Like a key uh, measure here is the interdistance between the, the elements, which is also another way of measuring the density. Mm -hmm. The more the, the lower the interdistance, the more heaters you have in the same volume. Mm -hmm. The higher the, 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 the interdistance, the least amount of heaters you have in that volume. But I assume it's quite a balance it's between a balance. the equipment you have to bring. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, of yeah. course. And if you look at this, you will see how long it will take, which mm -hmm. is usually, how long would it take to reach my temperature, my target temperature? Say I need to go to 250 degrees. How long would it take? Well, I'll tell you 250 degrees. This is the yellow one. Well, you see, if you if you have a, a heating element every half a meter, it will take three days. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you take it every three meters, you'll see here it will take you know, five months. Yeah, I prefer three days, yes. But, you know, having a heating element every half a meter will cost you a way lot more money in equipment to mm -hmm. mobilize more heating elements, more burners, more everything. So what you will save on time and energy, you will, of course, outspend on equipment. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a sweet spot to be found. Mm -hmm. And for in situ, it's really case by case because it, it depends on the depth of the drilling. Drilling costs will 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 play a big role in there. Uh, so you you'll see that it, it can vary from 1.5 to sometimes three, even four meters. In remote sites and in ex situ, it, it, it's much less. It's much more frequent to be around 1.5 meters. Okay, uh, because. Because there is the, the the length is always the same, so there is there are, there are less um, variables, so we more often into that as an optimum. There are some other limitations, but that's the optimum. As you can see, two types of targets: either your temperature target is below 100 or it's above 100. Below 100 is typically for light contaminants, perchlor PCE, TCE, the mm -hmm. chlorinated solvents for as soon as it's hydrocarbons, pH. Uh, more toxic stuff, dioxins, now PFAS, you need to go at a higher temperature. So this is typically what you're going to see at each site. You take each temperature probe, it will follow a profile where it will reach 100 degrees, it will stay at 100 degrees for a certain amount of time, and then it will start to pop up okay. and, and reach target temperature. And in stage four, it's when you have reached a temperature where you saw this, we now you start to cool it down. Okay. How long will that take, that stage two? It all depends on how much water you have in the soil. And here I, brings me to the important part of how critical water is to time and money. Um, as you can see in this uh, graph, the green and then the dark blue part, those two parts, which is almost 70%, is the energy needed to heat the water and boil the water, to, to, to extract the water. So out of 100%, more than two thirds of your energy for a 15% moisture soil, is going to be used to take out the water. Okay, just to understand this point. So you are suggesting to maybe to do a pre preliminary step to remove the water before heating? This is this this will sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, right? So this is for 15%. Look at this next slide. Okay. You'll see that if you go from five to twenty percent, right? In you will see how much, and it's, it's here depending on interdistance, but take whatever, two and a half meter interdistance, you will see that all things being equal, on the one hand, it's 40 days, on the other, it's 110 days. Mm -hmm. All things being equal. What I'm saying here is it's clear that if you can take water off with other means than heating it with this, it will be better. It will okay. be faster. So in some remote sites, we can, for example, let it dry for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Let it because we're going to dredge it. It's better to let it dry, and because every kilo of water you take out is something that will in, that will um, that will save you money, and that will obviously save you time. That's essentially what 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 the message is. It's also driving the total cost. The, the total cost is much more driven by water than by anything else. Then 
The specific case about remote sites was energy source. You remember when, when I spoke in introductions about specificities? It's not that when you're in a remote site, you have the whole range of available energy sources like we have here. If we, we are here, we want some diesel we can have. We, we are connected to the natural gas grid. We're connected to the electrical grid. We can have essentially whatever we want. When you're in remote sites, your choices are much, lim much more limited. And also the cost of energy is quite different and can vary from one site to another. So it's important to see what type of energy, uh, of energy sources. And often we have, we've been faced with the discussion whether it has to be, say, diesel or, or uh, diesel or electric, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, why does that matter? Well, the first, remember, electricity is not a primary energy. It doesn't come from Zeus, right? It comes from, <laughs> it comes from something. And usually in remote areas, it comes from generators, mm -hmm. no, no matter what. And so generators come from diesel, right? Or maybe sometimes natural gas or for all the ones you could even have coal. But that's essentially the, the, the point is to look at how electricity is produced. And that can differ quite vastly from region to region. And then, of course, to look at the impact that has, because for one kilowatt hour, you need you need to see what what how many kilowatt hours of primary energy you need because that will drive the cost and also the carbon footprint uh, in this case. Um, now going to uh, gas or liquid fuels, uh, the, the question we will will have to address is sustainability, whether they are bio or not, whether they're carbon neutral. It's the same question for electricity, where it's green electricity or gray electricity, whether it's green or gray uh, liquid or gas fuels and that that option is not always available. In some cases it is, some cases it's not. That will also depend from one region to another. There is another element very important that plays a, a, a key role in remote areas, which is available power. Mm -hmm. So what is power? Um, energy, uh, I, I always I often compare it to a water faucet, right? The, the, the energy is the amount of water that flows from your faucet. The, the power is how big your faucet is. If you have a big faucet, you have big power. What matters, what you pay is actually the water. It's not the size of the faucet. But sometimes you'll see that it's important to have a bigger faucet because you can you can use less water with a bigger faucet with a small one. And that's the case in thermal. Uh, usually when you work with, with gas you have, with or with diesel, you have no limit on available power. They can provide you as much as you want. There is no limit. There are usually very strict limits on available electrical power, in particular in islands or remote areas where the generators already are designed to provide the electricity for the communities. There is no spare electricity available usually. So you either have to bring it yourself because there, there, there won't be a lot uh, available on the grid. Um, but why is that important? It's because if you have a limit on available power, electrical, that will drive how much energy you can inject per day in the soil. So usually that is the big limiting factor where you talk about electrical heating, mm -hmm. which is when we do the math and the calculation, also the reason why it's not very attractive to apply in remote locations and to heat it with electricity. That's that's okay. the key reason is the available power. And, and then if you have to bring in generators, now, you, now, now it, it, it's crazy because you're going to use diesel to generate electricity and and to heat the soil and, and, and which, which is it, you will lose energy of it's, it, it will cost you three times as much than than, okay. than just heating it directly right so uh, it's also why in the energy or in in, in the conversion we, we try to convert like cars to electric because it's mechanical energy but there is no big push to convert heating of houses with electrical heaters right mm -hmm. so it, it, it's still uh it's still much more effective to heat it with okay. Thermal efficiency, when you compare it, in electricity, in best case, is about 30%, and in thermal heating, it's about 85%. That tells you everything you need to know in why is it cheaper and more climate friendly to do it with gas and even better with biogas or biodiesel than to do it with gray electricity. Yeah, and there are still 15 minutes in front of us. Yeah, okay. I'm almost. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll accelerate. Just to. To switch to the next, I, I spoke about how to heat the soil, now how to recover the vapors. And what is specific about remote? There are essentially three ways to recover vapors. The reburn, we're going to talk about that, which is very specific. You can handle it ex situ, which is taking your gases and applying ad hoc gas treatment. And then you can neutralize them in situ, which is something pretty new and innovative that we have to talk and I'll address 
briefly just to clear you already. <laughs> so what is Ribbon? Ribbon works for oil mainly, and you'll see with 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 the uh, thermoreactive can even work with with some chlorinate as well. But the idea is hydrocarbons is the pollution when you thermally disorb it, they come out of the soil under vapor form. Well, we're going to use those vapors as fuel again because it was fuel at the beginning. Then it became contamination. Now it's fuel again. Okay. And as you can see on this picture from an in situ site, the vapors that come out are re-injected in a specific point in the burner that is designed very well to know exactly to, to make sure that it's complete combustion, and that will then help the energy balance and help to be uh, to be treated. The, 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 the beauty about it, of course, the, to the, it destroys the contaminants because it and it actually recycles them because it uses them for what their purpose was, fuel uh, or energy, and it reduces fuel consumption. But I think more important in remote area, it's zero waste. You have no waste. There is it, it's just there. You don't you have no mm -hmm. carbon. You have no, nothing else. So mm -hmm. I think it's very very uh, interesting. And as you can see, this is on a pile on on the remote side. You can see how the vapors are extracted and are re injected. In the in the burner itself, so that there is no there is no vapor treatment. Yeah, it's not required a lot of investment no, to. Exactly. That's the alternative on conventional, let's say, uh, chlorinated solvent, uh, you could say PFAS, uh, uh, mercury sites where you can collect the vapors, you cannot destroy them by 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 uh, burning them. So you need to condense them. So, so with with the different heat exchangers and condensers, you need to filter them go to carbon and then eventually even go to thermal oxidizing uh, or carbon or catalytic oxidation. So that's essentially a, a larger unit, which is the mm -hmm. conventional way of treating vapors, right? Can you just give us an order of magnitude of the price of such installation? Well, it, it, this, it, it's hard to give you an order of magnitude because it will depend on the size, but it, it, it it's going to be in, in, in definitely in the hundreds of thousands, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not only the cost of the unit, it's also the logistics that are within, because now you need to mobilize that unit. Okay. You need to bring it and to demobilize it, and then that unit will generate waste. If you have carbon filters, it means that you have used carbon. So all that is sometimes you have no choice, right? Then you have to apply it. But when you have a choice, the reburn is a great alternative because you don't need any of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then the last but not least is something that we have applied recently, which is thermoreact. The idea was. If you have in particular sulfur or chlorine in the soil, we would like to do, instead of sending it to vapor treatment, which is what we do now, it would be better if we could reburn it because there's also hydrocarbons in it. Mm -hmm. But because of these other halogens, we cannot do that. So our idea was, in, why don't we neutralize them and make salt with it? As you can see here, it's, it's a composition, it's a patented product that we have developed, which will neutralize those sulfur and chlorinated vapors in situ at the best place where they can be neutralized where there is good contact time and high temperature which is a perfect reactor in the soil itself and what exits there is exempt of sulfur and chlorine mm -hmm. as you can see here the, the the here you could see a good example of a case in red temperature and and this is sulfur production in the vapors that come out of the soil mm -hmm. without thermoreact you can see it with thermoreactor. It's not yet zero, right? Mm -hmm. But it's definitely low enough so that you can reburn it and have the advantages of not needing a complete vapor treatment unit and also going back to zero. Okay. So just to summarize this slide, it's just meaning that we are not obliged anymore to work with a vapor treatment unit because we have a solution yep. to keep working Absolutely. in the reburn Absolutely. process. Okay. And, but that works now for sulfur, a little bit for chlorine, not yet, of course, for metals or, okay. or, or other stuff. So, but it, it's it's a very exciting development that, okay. that we have. So I'm going now to get into a couple of uh, case studies just to show you what how, how that ex situ uh, treatment can be applied. Um, starting with a pretty remote uh, site, as you can see, a beautiful site in uh, in southern Greenland, a military base. Really, typically, you can see the base here. Um, it's, it's very remote. The only access is by sea. Uh, military site needed to be completely cleaned up, contamination with um, typically oil, helicopter oil, and, and, and uh, heavy bunker fuel and diesel. Um, the whole thing was... The alternative being to excavate everything in this case back to Denmark, which is which is crazy, or treat it there and not impact the environment and make sure that there is no contamination left behind.
-hmm. As you can see, it's uh, we treated different types of contaminants, but all hydrocarbon based, some more heavy than other, because it was a helicopter based, which is was, uh, the only access other than, than uh, by ship. Um, and to demonstrate that despite the relatively high uh, initial concentrations, we could get back soil that would be completely compliant mm -hmm. with nature. We're in the Arctic region. That means that nature has a harder time to take over. If we were, I'll show you another case in the in tropical regions where then higher residual concentrations in hydrocarbons are acceptable because nature will take over pretty quickly. Okay, in this case, it's, okay. more, it's a more sensitive environment. So in this in that case, we worked with in boxes and containers, I'm accelerating it, give you, giving you a picture. Of course, insulation in these climate is quite important. So the better insulated it is, the uh, the quicker it will go, and and of course the more effective it will be. In this case, heating time was less than 20 days, which is quite important, and five days of cooling, and then you could dismantle. As you can see here, after 20 days, we reached the target temperatures of about 325 degrees, um, and of course very sensitive environment, making sure that your emissions are completely measured and controlled and that you don't exceed the regulatory limits, which was the case uh, absolutely here as well. And from scratch to the end of the of the, the project, how long did the day? It, it was about uh, four weeks to set it up. So okay. once it was delivered, the logistics are the logistics. They would come by ship, but once it was delivered, mm -hmm. then started in heating, and then it was a couple of weeks of dismantling. Okay. So in other in other words, these are also uh, areas where you have to come in and out in a very short season, mm -hmm. because the sea the, 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 there's 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 no way you can work through the winter there. So you, you had to go pretty quickly, and and that was also okay. uh, quite important. So very effective, uh, and 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 overcoming the logistic problem, etc. I'm just talking about another one in, in Southeast Poland, which is also nice because it combines ex situ and pretreatment. This is, as you can see, a nice area, water, uh, um, but unfortunately the bottom of it uh, contains very toxic sludges. And uh, with our partner in this case, uh, or our Polish partner, the, they dredged the, the sediments, pretreated the sediments, and then we treated the sediments in piles all on site, nothing left aside that you can see over some you know, fall and winter at times uh, in, in different piles. And as you can see here, these are the filter cakes that were coming out from the dredged material after uh, being uh, yeah. dried, yeah. As, as, as you said at the beginning, whatever you can take mechanically, take it mechanically. Uh, and then of course, here's the vapor treatment. I'll finish with an oil field in Congo because it's a very remote location, in this case completely contrary to the Arctic one in the mm -hmm. tropical equatorial region, uh, where, as you can see here, it's an oil field, so they had tens of thousands of tons of soil contaminated from different spills all over the, that was brought to one central place, and we treated it in one central place. We're currently doing exactly the same right now, working in South Sudan, same conditions. You bring it in, one pile is in construction, while the other one is cooking, is, is dismantling and in construction, it's about 30 days per batch, and it's about 3,500 tons per month. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, the, 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 the placements in lasagna, you can see a, a few pictures of these burners. And to give you an idea also, because we're pretty proud of that, uh, is that at the end of the day, in this case, we didn't reburn because they had plenty of you know, flare gas and we recondensed the vapors and we recovered 70% of all the oil that was spilled was recovered as oil. And as you can see here, at the back of the pile, we take the vapors and then we send them to a pretty simple condensation exchanger. And here is the oil we were producing. We're producing 20 to 25 barrels of oil per day, which was quite spectacular because we recovered essentially most of the contaminants uh, in this site. In this specific case, does the speciation of the condensate product was quite similar to the initial product, to the initial contamination? Or? It was, it, it's a good point because we thought it would be identical. It wasn't. It was actually a bit improved. In other words, it had shorter chains. Okay. So it didn't settle the same way. So it was actually better crude oil. Okay. So, okay. Uh, okay. but we didn't, we, we did, we did not know that from uh, when we started. I'm just going to go quickly. It's a sensitive environment. Why I, I picked up this site, it's in the center of Paris. 
uh, it's not a remote location. <laughs> no, but I, I, I just wanted to show you. Let me go back to uh, the overall site and then I'll be done, I promise. Um, <laughs> See, it's a school that was built on a plan that was essentially contaminated with mercury. I'm not going to go into the whole history, but just to tell you here, you have people, you have gardens, you have here, you had apartments on the right hand side. So it, it's a very dense environment. And so the whole idea is in this case, where there is also a pile, it needed to be done and to be able to prove that you can, that we did not impact anything in the air. And that's exactly what happened. And because it's not because you're in a remote area that your environmental conditions must be lax or it, they, it, to the contrary, they usually need to be stricter. So if it can be done in the center of Paris, it can be done anywhere else. So and the same thing, it's mercury. So it's the other exception. Mercury, of course, it's not reburned. It has to be condensed, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. We had horizontal pile, uh, heating elements under the school. We had piles with all drill cuttings. Um, and that was all condensed at one central location. And after reaching 350 degrees all over the place, which was measured, this is a, a picture of a vapor treatment unit with condensation. And then, you, as you can see in this in this example, we were then recovering liquid mercury in uh, at the central, the coldest point. Is it pure mercury? It's pure mercury, and it's tin bottles. Which these bottles are still today at school, which is open now. And they kept it as a memory of what the site was. Okay. So it, it's liquid mercury, absolutely. Um, yeah, we cannot transform it into any, in anything else. Um, I think I'm going to leave it here and conclude with just why now, why ESCD is appropriate for remote locations. As an introduction, I told you what the specificities are. And I think this, I, I could uh, illustrate how easy it is to mobilize ESTD to few containers and containers are easy to mobilize at something that is practical. Usually there is logistics for that because it's very, very used to, to do this. Um, there are very few moving parts in the, in the whole process. So that means very low maintenance. So no mm -hmm. risk of having like a, a bearing that breaks and then you need to stop for six weeks mm -hmm. and your season is over. You don't have that. Uh, so units are very robust because not much moving <laughs> anyway. So, mm -hmm. so that's the, uh, uh, by design, it's extremely scalable. It can be applied for 2,000 tons, and it can be applied for 200,000 tons. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it's just a little bit more room, but it, it's it's very scalable. You need not to be connected to any form of grid, no water grid, no electrical grid, no gas grid, no net. It, it can be done with some with with stuff that you bring in. So I think it's very important for remote location. It's a complete on-site treatment. There's no dig and dump, and you leave no waste behind. So it's it's. There is, it's a zero waste complete process. No pollution left behind, I'm, I'm anticipating. And as I said, it's actual treatment. When we leave it, it's done, it's finished. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very uh, important process. And I'll leave it there almost in time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you, Ian, for this very intense presentation. Uh, I mean, you, it was a big overview of the technologies and we have a, a quite a good idea about what we can do uh, remotely. Um, I think for the questions, I, I assume it was like live in discussion, so, and we do not have a lot of time in front yeah, of sorry us. sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I did my best. I'm, yeah, I'm but I, I, I expected this one to be <laughs> frank. Um, but, um, so just the practical information, because it was really intense. Uh, do you have two possibilities now? The first one is you can connect in five hours for the second uh, webinar that will be the same subject, but for the US. Uh, the, the US states and or you can directly jump to the YouTube channel and you can uh, you can just watch back watch again uh, this, uh, this this webinar. Uh, no, just after this webinar, you will directly received the, the certificate of patency and um, and, to, and see you see you in exactly one month for another very interesting webinar. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for your presence for this webinar. Thank you all, and uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And if you have special questions, we'll definitely follow that up. Thank you very much. Bye.